Good afternoon, traders and investors. Will back here with another one. Hopefully, all of you have been having a very beautiful long weekend so far. And welcome back again to another edition of our subscriber request video, where we go through the comment section and take all of the tickers that you guys have requested from me over the past few weeks and take a look at them both on a fundamental and technical aspect and determine whether or not I like these companies and what we could possibly do with them. Now, keep in mind, guys, these will all be my opinions on the matter. So none of this will be financial advice but I always appreciate you guys for bringing forward these tickers. Obviously, there is so many different stocks in the stock market, and although I do know a very large part of a lot of them, I don't obviously know everything, of course, about every single company. So I really do appreciate when you guys bring these tickers to light. It always helps me get new ideas into certain industries or certain niche plays that I may not have seen. So I appreciate all you guys for bringing those forward. So in today's video, guys, we have a number of different requests to go over. We have about 13 different requests here a couple of people have put in multiple requests and since we don't have that many people that have requested as a whole i will be doing multiple tickers per person for this one time exception but in the event that we do have multiple tickers per person i'll be going over them a bit quicker than usual here guys so once again very brief fundamental rundown and then technical analysis and then my final opinion on that stock so without further ado guys let's jump right into it and let us set the expectation for the types of companies that I'm looking for long-term investments. Now, moving forward, guys, it might be interesting as well, and this is my fault for not specifying this, right? But if you bring me a ticker, it would be very interesting as to what is your plan or thesis with the ticker. Is it just a swing trade opportunity? Is it a momentum play per se, that you're just looking to make a swing trade for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and then you're out? Or is it something you're considering to add to a long-term portfolio to hold for a longer-term thesis 5, 10, 15, 20 years as building a long-term investing position, right? That would help me get a little bit better insight as to the direction that we can take uh, with each one of these picks, right? So moving forward, probably that's when I ask all you guys to highlight into that just to give me a better indication of potential strategies that we can apply for these plays, right? So getting into the um, details of what I like to look for in a company for a long-term investment. This is not so much going to be a swing trade, although I like to see all of these characteristics as well in a swing trade, right? Momentum, obviously, we can kind of forego a lot of these, especially if it's a momentum trade trade, right? A non-profitable company, a up and coming tech company, stuff like that, right? So we can forego a few of the fundamentals for a pure based momentum trade, but for a longer term investment, right? If we're looking for a quality company, here are some of the rules that I love to follow here, guys, in relation to having good fundamental analysis, good valuations of businesses as well, right? So always remember a stock's price is a reflection of future earnings and future cash flows. If you want the price of a stock to go up, well, it stands to argue your future earnings and future cash flows have to be consistently rising as well. If not, Wall Street will not bless you with a rising share price. Very, very rarely, if ever, right? So number two, do not chase the market. It. Let the market come to you. There's over 500 blue chip stocks in the market right now and over 8,000 tradable tickers that we can currently have access to in North American markets, guys. There is always an opportunity, so never feel the need to chase a play in the event you missed it. Now, a few of the things that I like to look out for, guys. Number one, for uh, pure form value investing, fundamental investing, we need to be looking for companies that have a competitive advantage in its industry, otherwise known as a moat. Is it a company like Costco that provides better value? value for a better price than most of its industry competition, right? Is it a company like NVIDIA that is a first mover in the data center business and that has a somewhat of an outright monopoly right now? Is it also a company perhaps, um, you know, another company that comes to mind, is it a company like Visa or MasterCard, which have a complete arguably duopoly on the entire payment processing industry? These are otherwise known as massive competitive advantages and otherwise known as moats. And if the company has a heavy competitive advantage and a heavy moat, usually the following characteristics will um, will be allowed to manifest in terms of improving year over year in a consistent fashion. Looking for consistently increasing revenue and EPS. Much easier to do that if you have a commanding competitive advantage and moat across the industry. Consistently higher increasing free cash flows every single year in a consistent fashion. This as well is much easier done when you have a clear competitive advantage. 
Now, number four, high return on capital employed and high returns on invested capital. These are two metrics of whether or not a company can leverage the internal cash it receives either from raising debt or from raising equity from the market. When they get cash, either from the business or from investments, can they leverage that cash properly? Every dollar they receive, how much revenue are they able to go get from that uh, cash, right? Now, number five, relatively low debt as well. We do not want a company to be overburdened by debt because that prevents them from either paying dividends or doing share buybacks, two things that netly increase your ROI over time in that security. And then to top it all off, guys, not only do we want to find these beautiful companies with gorgeous fundamental characteristics, we want to find them at very large support areas. We do not want to be buying companies at all-time high breakouts with overbought RSIs on the daily and weekly, guys. Not a very good risk-to-reward proposition. We'd rather wait for those companies to come back into very solid support levels on the higher timeframes, daily, weekly, and monthly. So to cap it all off, guys, the name of the game is to find companies with solid fundamentals and a great technical entry. That is when you usually know that you usually have a very good either swing trade on your hands or a very good long-term investment at a good price as well. So let's jump into some of the requests real quick, shall we? So moving into the first one, uh, AJ asking, requesting NNE. So the SoFi and Ford portion of the question, I did answer in AJ's comment. In terms of NNE, let's have a look right away. So company number one, NNE, Nano Nuclear Energy. So this is a company that's trying to do micro reactors. Uh, they're pretty much a dime a dozen at this current time, guys. A lot, a lot, a lot of these companies have been propped up in the last three, four years. The technology for, mi for micro or smaller modular reactors, instead of having a huge, large insta installation, these reactors can be brought closer to a place that needs high energy requirements. Think of data center applications, right? And you can literally move the reactor very close, set it up on a uh, specific site designated for that, right? And then generate the power from there. So that is the business model as a whole. It's a very nice business model in theory, but there's a few complications for it. As I've said, guys, these micro reactors are not new technology. They have been designed since the 1970s and the 1980s. It is just now that we're figuring out the last steps as to actually commercializing and scaling that technology to where it's safe and it is also energy efficient too, right? So moving on down, so the two other main competitors in this business right now who have received heavy funding are SMR and Oclo. Oclo actually has uh, funding from Sam, Sam Altman, the founder, founder of OpenAI. So they have a lot of hype and um, you know news press articles around them, but those are two of the main competitors right now for NNE, as you guys can see, right? So there's no fundamentals for this business whatsoever. They generate absolutely no revenue in terms of the cash that they're sitting on hand right now. They do have a little bit of cash talking about, you know, $7 million, but it's definitely not much when you're burning, you know, 10, $20 million type of thing every single, uh, or, you know, roughly $10 million every single quarter moving forward. And in terms of the analyst expectations, guys, there's literally only one analyst who has a, um, you know, the potential analysis on this stock. And funny enough, the analysis is provided by their by the analyst that is actually the company's underwriter as well. So there's a big conflict of interest right there. This company also has no patents. It is trying to derive two iterations of micro nu uh, nuclear reactors, but as of now, has no pure form patents that sets it apart from the competition. And they also said from the company's prospectus, after I looked into it, there is no likely sales for the entire decade. This is still in the research and development portion of the business. And as I've said multiple times, we've covered a few of these so far on the channel. This really requires industry expertise to analyze the reactor viability, guys. You really have, this has to be your niche. It has to be your bread and butter. You have to be extremely well-versed in the industry, guys, to know and recognize whether or not this company has a viable product. I myself am, suffice to say, I do not have the required industry expertise to be, to be able to derive, do they have a better product than their competition, better than SMR, better than Oclo, better than existing products as well, right? So it's very difficult for me to determine whether or not the company has a competitive advantage as a whole. And a lot of valuation from these companies that have no revenue whatsoever right now comes from extremely far out cash flow future projections, guys. So this entirely is speculation. It is a show me company. Show me meaning you they're eventually going to have to show us some revenue, show us some scale, because as of now, it's pretty much just a pipe dream uh, to say the least, right? 
So we can't really derive any fundamentals from there. We know that the total addressable market is expanding. The requirement for energy, especially with the onslaught of AI and the electrification of uh, vehicle fleets and stuff like that, over time, we're going to put more and more pressure on the electrical grid and on energy demands as a whole. So we're going to need other types of companies like this. But this technology, guys, is still, in my humble opinion, a good five, six, seven years away. So it is a longer term thesis, right? Now, if it's a longer term thesis, thesis, you may have to wait a heck of a long time for this thesis to play out. So if it's a long-term investment, it's going to be a very long, long-term investment, right? But at least you're kind of getting in at the ground floor. The company is worth only about $300 billion micro cap status right now. So essentially right now it is a lottery ticket, lottery ticket for me, because I do not know enough about their business versus their competition. And to be quite honest with you, to become an expert in this category, guys, it would, it would literally take probably months and months of research to really know the ins and the outs of every single business, the energy output, the logistics criteria for implementing these things across North America or internationally, right? So many moving parts in this business. The best we can do here, guys, is give somewhat of a rudimentary technical analysis for momentum purposes. And as we can see, right, the only relevant area of recent support that we have down here is about nine to about six dollars. Now, we can't even derive if that's actual fair value because the company doesn't have any revenue whatsoever. They have projections, but until they finally have sales and expenses that we can go for, all those projections as well are simply that they are only projections, right? So moving on, guys, you know, we can potentially tentatively take a position in here but it's going to be an entirely technical analysis trade, right? What we're looking for right now is really looking for this uh, monthly higher lows for potential, potential further trend expansion if there's any hype or momentum surrounding this company, right? So in terms of uh, price action right now, the price action isn't really doing too much. Very, very, very tight range right here. So I would be looking for a momentum break to the upside, guys. Break of probably 1140 to the upside. Break on the daily gives us a stop loss. The stop loss goes below here, 958. And then we start targeting the upper levels around that $17 level. That's the best we can do for a breakout if ever we come down lower into the support area. Same thing. For these momentum-based companies, we need to wait for the momentum to be here. If not, we can get trapped for a very long time, right? So wait to see that momentum on a daily uptrend if we come down here to set up for the daily trend change attempt and you get in when you have the daily trend change, so that you're set your stops below the most recent daily lows, something like this, or you go for the breakout, uh, the breakout trade, right? And then the stops go below the lows right here. So pure, pure, pure momentum-based technical analysis trade, in my humble opinion, or an extremely long-term bet for this company. Sorry, I can't give you more insight into it, uh, AJ, but I would be completely lying if I would tell you that I'm an expert in the energy sector, right? So that's the best that I can possibly do for that name. Now, Rerome61 asks, have I looked into Skechers? I'm a podiatrist and most of my senior patients wear them. Well, thank you very much. Of course, let's take a look into Skechers. So Skechers is a very well-known brand, right? The company's been uh, in existence for quite some time and had their IPO pretty much in 1999. And the stock price, although it does, you know, tend to range bound, consolidate for years and years and years, can go on these massive, tra uh, these massive tears. Now, Skechers has been more popular, especially with the youth, not only with seniors as well. And I brought up the chart of Google Trends. Here's your interest over time. I love to see these, especially for fashion companies, right? Uh, I love to see the fashion trend over time, whether there's more or less interest going into them. And as you can see here, guys, since 2016, the trend has been quite favorable for Skechers. Arguably now, it's at the peak of the popularity that it ever has been in recent history. So at least in terms of brand exposure, they're getting in front of a lot of eyes right now and is also uh, bringing a lot of attention to the stock share price too. Stock share price has been performing quite well recently and the fundamentals of the business guys are quite good as a whole. The business is only worth about 10.43 billion and they do bring in about eight and a half billion dollars of sale, uh, sales in the uh, 2024 upcoming period, right? So decent company, decent margins as well. You never expect to see two crazy margins uh, from footwear companies, usually between six to 10% is standard. So they're well within the industry standard, at least in the most recent couple of years. In terms of the balance sheet as well, they've really done a great job at cleaning up their balance sheet here. They do have about $2 billion worth of debt, but they have a nice amount of cash on hand right now, about a billion dollars. And they're bringing in a lot of free cash flow. Free cash flow is a lot more consistent in the last year and a half for this company. I would not say the balance sheet is a problem. In terms of your experience, 
expansion prospects for the company. EPS slated to be expanding over the next couple of years. That's a very good thing. And revenue is also slated to be expanding. So I like to see the consistency here in the Skechers brand over the foreseeable future. In terms of valuation here, guys, 9.2% revenue growth through 2027. This is a per year basis. EPS 16.4, very healthy. Gives them a forward PE at 65 bucks of about a 15.5. That's not really too high at all. And when we divide this by their EPS growth rate, we get a beautiful peg ratio of under one. Under one, guys, is a very decent valuation. Between one and two is okay. And above two is quite elevated. So to see them under one, even if they are close to the all-time highs, is very, very good signs that the company does uh, have room to expand to the upside, right? It's not foreign to see a lot of these um, apparel companies trade for two times price to sales. As you can see here, guys, companies worth about eight, um, companies bringing in about $8 billion. And the valuation right now, the market cap is about 10.43. This can expand to about 15 billion, right? So you could potentially see some upside momentum and continuation and valuation expansion, maybe all the way through about 90, $100 over the next maybe one to two years. So there is some runway to grow here. Obviously, the headwinds right now are consumer discretionary spending, but they have been holding up a lot better than most. So it's not the best environment to be investing uh, in this type of company with consumer discretionary spending down, but I wouldn't say that their valuation is so bad per se. And I had a very quick glance at their earnings, guys, their earnings that came out roughly about a month ago at this time, and their earnings were actually quite good. They didn't notice too much consumer slowdown uh, for their brands as a whole. So all in all, I do like this company, guys. The only problem is that we're slightly elevated right now. In the event we start revisiting maybe the lower $60 range where you have a wider uh, wider area of support down here, this could be an interesting trade to take, right? At that point, we'd just be looking for a bit further monthly consolidation. Not quite sure if we're gonna get it or not here, guys, but 59 down to about 55, if we do see it, I do think there is good value down here in this company. In terms of shares outstanding as well, they've started buying back some shares ever so slightly. They haven't really done that in the company's uh, most recent 15 year history. So nice to see them using that increase, those increases in free cash flow to buy back a few of their shares. And as you can see, free cash flow, although was inconsistent in the most recent couple of years after COVID, of course, usually, right, it was showing a good trend, but still not very consistent as a whole. Not the best chart, but at least they are improving. So Skechers, yes, I do like the company to say that they're maybe, um, to say that they're as solid as uh, perhaps some of your more legacy players or more legacy other brands in the game. It might be a little bit of a stretch, right? The one company that I always compare uh, uh, footwear companies to is Decker's Outdoor Brands, right? So they are very, very a very solid internally managed company per se. You can say what they want about their products. They're just extremely good at managing the business. So this one looks fairly decent. Thank you very much for bringing that up to me, uh, Rerome. Now, Miss Unique 65 asking, can I review ATKR on the next viewer recommendations? Of course, absolutely. So let's take a look at ATKR. So ATKR, this is a company here that operates, uh, it's labeled as electrical products, but they do a few different things. Not only do they do um, so what they do essentially is wire casing. So let's say you have a, a more commercial grade applications too, right? Um, so in terms of, let's say you have a bunch of wires together and you need a plastic or PVC casing around the wires, they will, uh, they do those types of services, but they also do PVC and other forms of plumbing, um, uh, plumbing, um, you know, uh, let's say um, pipes or stuff like that, right? I was looking for the, I was looking for the word, but it was literally right there. Uh, so plumbing applications too. So electrical plumbing, mostly piping and wire wrapping and stuff like that, right? So very decent company um, in terms of uh, the backside of the uh, industrial production capacity. So I always like taking a look at these companies as well. And they've had a heck of a drop off here in the most recent four or five months of trading. Now, a few of these things here, guys, is the, uh, I always like comparing them to the industry leader, which is right now Eaton. Eaton is about a hundred and I think they're about $120 billion company, right? So when we put them, when we put other competitors up, I always like comparing them to the best in the business right now. So any analysis that we can possibly do on ATKR, uh, if you're doing this one at home, you're, you're uh, pretty much industry leader standard should be based off of ETN. Even if they have slightly different products, still roughly the same guys. It's the management of the business model that counts the most. Now, 
Here is what I found in my research as well for ATKR. They do have allegations of price fixing in 2022 and 2023. They're part of a class action lawsuit by a few uh, utilities companies uh, that say that they were price gouging. This company and another company whose name I forget, you can find the lawsuit online, however, uh, and you can actually see those details here in the progression of the company over the last couple of years, right? So let's have a look right here and you'll see exactly what they mean. So you can see explosive growth in 2021, 22, and 2023. The allegations that the, is that they were price fixing, benefiting from the supply chain constraints of 2021 and 2022 to raise prices through the absolute roof and essentially price gouge their customers, which by large uh, are utilities companies or other uh, commercial companies. And now that that pricing power has eroded, you can see diminishing EPS returns and also diminishing revenue returns as well. So this is something that I don't necessarily like to see from the company and could be one of the reasons that they're really starting to really drop off coming back and giving back a lot of that valuation. It stands to argue if you're not growing EPS and not growing revenue, well, Wall Street's going to be very hesitant to grow your share price or allow your multiple to expand, right? Now, also some allegations of not, well, allegations, this is just fact at this point, non-organic revenue growth. So most of their growth is done through acquisitions. Now, this isn't so much of a bad thing, guys. I can tell you guys a number of different companies who grow through acquisitions as well. Microsoft was one of them for a very long time. Uh, uh, Salesforce was another one for a very long time too in the technology industries. Obviously, this is one way to grow, guys but we would like to see a little bit more organic revenue growth, right? Expanding their own sales pipeline as opposed to acquiring because acquiring other businesses obviously costs money uh, in that respect, right? So in terms of their balance sheet, Balance sheet is not too bad, decent amount of debt, but nothing in relation to the free cash flow they bring in and their amount of cash and cash equivalents. So that is looking good. And we already saw their expansion graphs, right? Declining EPS and declining revenues per se. That being said, this company does have very, very solid internal fundamentals, very high return on capital employed and very high return on equity as well. So that's why we have a bunch of analyst targets well above your price estimates right now, the midpoint of which is about 130. Most of everyone either has hold or buy ratings. So not looking too bad there as well. And as well, guys, the company is trading roughly around book value right now. Their mark, well, price, one price to sales rather. Their market cap is about 3.35 billion. And as a whole, they are bringing in about 3.35 billion or 3.5 billion per year. So trading roughly around one price to sales. I wouldn't say that the company is, is uh, far overvalued. If anything, it's actually coming into fair value. But it's a question of the growth, right? Can they maintain the growth for the next five to 10 years? So fundamental investment for me, um, in terms of putting in a long-term portfolio, maybe not just because we don't have that uh, consistency over the long term just yet. You'd rather go with maybe one of your industry leaders if you're doing a longer term portfolio allocation because they have a commanding market share of the industry as a whole so far. Uh, but in terms of a swing trade, we definitely do have swing trade capacity right here coming down to this 95 all the way down to about 80. Would be tempted to maybe wait for this chart to bottom out ever so slightly more. Weekly is oversold right now. We know it's in a weekly downtrend. So so eventually we're going to need to get, if you want to see this weekly up a downtrend reverse, you're going to eventually need to see the formation of a daily uptrend, right? So what we start to need see, what we need to start seeing right here is that daily uptrend. Once we get the daily uptrend confirmation, when we break out of the higher high, that is when we can, when we can actually take a position right here because it gives us a better indication of where we can put our stop loss, right? below this because if it then rolls over, well then unfortunately we did not find the weekly lows and we are simply wrong, right? So right, right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify the weekly lows of the move and go for a little bit of a swing trade. So for that, we need to wait for a confirmation from our daily charts. Hopefully that's helpful. I would be looking for that pattern within this lower bound of support right there. But thank you very much for bringing that one up. Very interesting uh, company. Now, in terms of P.O. Box, request for QBTS and IONQ. If you guys don't know, uh, P.O. Box is the GOAT pretty much for bringing us some small and micro cap plays on the channel, right? Uh, a lot of these are uh, very, very momentum based, but the guy has been pretty much killing it with a lot of his picks in terms of being at the right place at the right time and just waiting for those little upswings in those stocks. It's one way to trade, one way to invest. I'm not here to say that one way is better than another. This is really just pure uh, micro caps right now, right? So let's go through those two very, very quickly. And in terms of fundamentals, guys, both of these companies don't really have much, right? They're quantum computing plays. Um, a lot of them sometimes get featured on, you know, investing forums such as Wall Street Bets and stuff like that. And they can go on sometimes a couple of weeks, maybe even a month or two of uh, crazy momentum rallies, right? And that's when you have to kind of strike when the iron is hot. 
Uh, you just buy for the momentum rally and know what you're doing, right? The fundamentals aren't backing these companies. These are pure, pure, pure momentum driven trades right now. So QBTS, although the company doesn't have uh, much revenue to speak of whatsoever, you can see here on a yearly basis, they may only bring in anywhere between five to $10 million. In terms of their balance sheet, of course, well, they don't really have much to show, although they are sitting on roughly $41 million of cash. The burn rate is quite high and they have accumulated a little bit of debt so far uh, to keep the business online as they try to scale their quantum computing business, right? In terms of EPS expansion, still won't be profitable much before 2027 and revenue expansion as well. 26 and 27 seems to be where that's at. So this is another one of those show me companies, right? They have nothing per se right now, but that's okay. This is one investing style. If you just want to sit and build a position, if you have a long-term view in the position, if you think you have some alpha because you have researched all of the quantum computing companies and you have de determined that this company has a slight competitive, ed competitive edge over its competition, whether those are uh, unique partnerships with some of the hyperscalers, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, things like that, right? Whether it's because their technology is incrementally better be of, than other companies because they have certain patents. If you have defined alpha for a long-term investment, then by all means, guys, go for it. I myself do not in the quantum computing industry, right? I haven't put in the time and research to determine that, uh, to make the determination that I am an expert in the industry. So for me, if I were to play this one, it would be a pure, pure, pure swing trade. And then once again, we need to wait for the momentum on these, right? We need to wait. It's very, very tough, right? You can sit in this stock uh, for months and months and months on end before you finally get that rally, right? Months and months sometimes before you get these rallies. So we need to be able to time them properly. So we're coming into this big, nice resistance area. Tentacles are, sorry, support area. Tentacles, right? Weekly downtrend. Now we're starting to get a little bit of an engulfing move looking not too bad, right? So a bit of a bounce right now, 50% bounce. Have they changed the daily uptrend? Yes, they have changed the daily uptrend right now. Daily higher lows are set. So we're gonna be looking for this trend expansion. Very easy way to play this right now, right? Can be some entries, but we have to target our daily higher lows for those because if we lose this, then we know unfortunately the weekly bounce is finished and we're looking to go a bit lower. So two formats of playing this, either we're trying to play this with the momentum now and going for highs, right? Highs and setting a tight stop loss or we're going to wait possibly if you believe that this is the end of possibly the weekly bounce and that would be designated by the loss of the daily uptrend break of 94 then we wait we wait and wait and wait because then we're waiting for the weekly higher lows to be set and as soon as you see eventually maybe down here a recapture of the daily uptrend we try to take this same trade again right swing trade stops go below the lows and then we keep them right we try to keep them for as long as possible as it starts moving up stop loss goes to break even these are momentum trades we do not want to round trip any profits or take a loss after being in a gain and then you kind of try and ride that momentum higher right pure 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 momentum play or long-term investment but if you want it to be a long-term investment you have to stay there until their thesis plays out and it seems to be the start of their thesis will start to be playing out in 26 and 27. So that's just my thoughts on the matter. Next, we're gonna do uh, the next one that he had, IONQ. So IONQ, exact, exact, exact same concept, right? Once again, this is one of the more talked about quantum computing plays, right? But still only in the R&D phase. Supposed to say that experts are saying supercomputers right now for the application that they have are much better. They're much easier to commercially scale as well. The commercial scale for quantum computing is about 20, 30 plus onwards. Uh, and there are excessive errors currently, but it is currently a very early technology, right? Still in the R&D phase, not yet a commercialized product to say the least in terms of that. So same investment thesis st uh, stands, right? So barely any revenue, burning money like no other. That is perfectly normal, guys. It's a burgeoning tech company. They largely rely on private investment. Once again, your thesis has to come out in 2026 and 2027, not much before then. So if you're in this one for the long term, guys, right? You can't, you have to kind of pretty much sit here until that long term thesis can grow and play out, right? That is unfortunately the cost of staying in these companies when you have a longer term thesis. Yes, they can turn into 10, 20 X's potentially, right? If the company does well, but you need to be in that stock until that thesis plays out if you want those returns. If not, you'll have to revisit it when back and later on the day, uh, later in the, in the years, right? In 2026 and 2027, perhaps when they are scaling, they do have 
have good revenues, well, then maybe only you're going to cash them when the company's worth, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten billion dollars, because then you have certainty and the market might have front ran you by then, right? So everybody here is going to have to wait a very long time for the long term thesis to play out. But if not, momentum trade, same, same, same rules as we just discussed for the previous one. We are in a very nice area of support right now. So I would be looking for those trend recaptures one by one, weekly downtrend right now. So you're going to look for that daily uptrend shift. We are almost getting it right now. So personally, myself, I would possibly be waiting for a break, break of 7.77. You can get a break of this daily uptrend is back underway, gives you a nice little area to manage your stop losses, which would be below here. And then we're pretty much going for that momentum rally, trying to get the bottoms of the weekly moves in motion and trying to time the upswing, right? So pure form momentum based trades. Thanks very much for bringing that one up for me. And why do I not have the list up right now? Perfect. Let's go it again. So now we have a user. Right, so uh, don't, not gonna say the rest of the characters. Let's just call him user. So user, will um, uh, in the next video, if the next video is based on the comment section, I'd love to see TENB and SMCI. So SMCI, I'll refer you, I'll leave a link in the description. I actually did this one after earnings a few weeks back. So if you want a more five to 10 minute in depth analysis of SMCI, just look at the uh, in the description. I'll leave the link to my video where I did the earnings recap. For now, we're gonna do TNB, TENB for you though. So TENB, this is a cybersecurity play. I've seen them before, but haven't really done any uh, deep, deep, deep dive um, analysis on them, right? I'm familiar with the company, but I wouldn't say I know it as well as a company like Palo Alto Networks or CrowdStrike or even Fortinet, right? But it is a decent sized company right now. Company's worth about $5 billion. One of the more up and coming companies as well, Sentinel One, which is getting a lot of hype as of recently too. They're only worth 7.5 billion. So you have a lot of these players here, guys, uh, you know, that are, for all intents and purposes, in terms of market caps, not that large, right? Cybersecurity is not a new industry, but is a massively growing industry with a ton of players. The industry has not really consolidated much so far. It's starting. As the lead players, Palo Alto and uh, CrowdStrike, as they start pulling away from everybody else, they will start assimilating everybody else's businesses, right? As soon as they lock away all the biggest contracts with the biggest companies in the game, all the other companies are going to be fighting for crumbs. This is going to be one industry, in my opinion, where the winners are going to take most and the rest of the companies are either, unfortunately, going to have to sell their businesses to those players or just simply, um, you know, run a very lean business with not that much potential for long term expansion. Right. So that's just my take on the cybersecurity industry as a whole. Now, in terms of this company, well, the company actually doesn't have that bad fundamentals, despite being a relatively small size. It is not that unprofitable. So it is an unprofitable company, but they are trying trying to gain a path to profitability. That path to profitability isn't slated to be much before 2026, 2027. So still a lot of time to come for net margin profitability. However, EPS consistently expanding. I like to see that revenue as well, consistently expanding. The one thing that I have to say about this company is that even though they're a small size at about $5 billion, you'd like to see if this was really one of the companies that you think is going to, you know, two, three X, right? Over the next couple of years, you need to see revenue growth rates in excess of 25, 30%. If you're only growing revenue at 10% and Palo Alto and, and uh, CrowdStrike are also growing revenue at 10%, well, it stands to argue, why would you go with this company, right? This company, you're trying to get into it because it has a cheap market cap and you want it to go two, three, four X over the next couple of years. It can only do that if it's growing its revenue extremely aggressively. If it's growing its revenue in line with the rest of the industry, guys, we cannot expect outsized market returns, right? And EPS is growing nicely, however, by 28.6%. So at least they are getting more efficient at managing capital and bringing more of that to the bottom line. That being said, at $41 right now, guys, stock trades at about a 34.7 PE. And we, when we divide that by their EPS growth rate, which is very good, by the way, we get about a 1.21 peg, which is not that bad. Couple the relatively low valuation with a very good area of support. And I could see a, a thesis right here for a short term swing trade in the company, potentially targeting anywhere in the 39s to 37s. And then it may just be a longer form swing trade. We know the cybersecurity industry right now has been slightly out of favor because there is a more, there's an overarching trend happening right now where a lot of very large scale companies are pulling back on the amount of spending that they're doing on software. 
enterprise software, both on enterprise management software, something like a Workday or a Salesforce, and also on cybersecurity. We've heard that from Palo Alto and CrowdStrike directly, that they've noticed this trend over the past two years of companies willing to pay less for um, software as a service um, you know, expenses. And as a byproduct, you know, it's getting a lot uh, stiffer in terms of competition within the industry to secure those contracts. Once again, reiterating my point where I think this industry is on the verge of consolidating towards the top. And unfortunately for this company and perhaps others, it may just be a case of winner takes most. So in terms of a long-term investment, not for me, but in terms of a swing trade, I could see some potential value down here for potentially a little bit of a swing trade back into the mid to high 40s. And, in, and uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of analysts would tend to agree with that. Most of all your price targets up here are netly above the current share price, and they do tend to have a good history of beating uh, on their EPS expectations and coming above as well on revenue expectations. So decent company, right? Decent company as a whole. Nothing bad to say about them other than the overarching uh, cybersecurity industry trends that I'm seeing as a whole. Now, moving on, let's get into Bethany's request. Hi, Will. What do you think about ON Holdings, SoFi, and PayPal? So similar to a uh, user's question right here, we actually did all three of these companies in earnings. I will leave in the description, guys, a link to every single one of the videos where I do a 10-minute in-depth analysis on each one of these companies with their most recent earnings and my expectation for them moving forward, all for ON, SoFi, and PayPal. I will leave those three links in the description as well as the SMCI ones. I'll obviously tag them down below with the ticker so you guys know which video it is. Yes. So what I'll do right now for you, Bethany, though, is we'll do a quick recap on the technicals for ON, SoFi, and PayPal, and just give my quick thoughts, right? So ON Semiconductor, ON Semiconductor, I love this one. You guys will see me playing this one a lot on the channel down here in the lower $70 range. They had tremendous earnings. The only problem with this company is that a lot of the revenue comes from the smartphone market and also from the... Um, from the EV market as a whole, especially because of, their, because of their sensor business, right? So that has been in a cyclical decline as of recently, but they're now starting to guide for a turning of the corner for the demand, right? Demand for their products was relatively low as opposed to what it was. Now it's getting better, which is why I say, guys, they've been protecting this area of support very, 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 very well. I would not be surprised if this company just continues to slowly, slowly recapture the levels, maybe over the course of the rest of 2024 and even into 2025, when we're said to be getting a lot better fundamentals. We're back to EPS growth, and we're also back to revenue growth as well. 2024, a little bit of transition year. I do really, really like this level. You'll see me, guys, write a lot of short puts in this area as well. The next company we're going to look at is SoFi. SoFi, I love this one. I was talking Talking about it in our private discord a lot this week love this breakout pattern if we get the breakout and possibly retest of the 750 maybe even seven dollar range again i love it down there guys 750 down to seven is really where i want to start playing sofi uh, as a whole love this company they had great 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 fundamentals as well of their business i do not know where those fundamentals went they're supposed to be here but i guess they just vanished apologies for that but all you need to know profitable company by now they were that was not always the case for sofi but over the last couple of quarters they're putting in profitability which is what wall street wanted and they're also expanding their internals very very well eps expansion to positive territory and fundamentals are good as well uh their loan provisions so the amount of money that they set aside for default on loans is very, very high right now. So the business is really not at risk. I like this one. It's one of my favorite uh, fintech plays for growth right now. As I said, you know, 750 down to $7 is the range that I'd be more keen on playing it. But I do like this one for the upside in the future. More details in the earnings video down below. And the last one's gonna be PayPal. So PayPal as well, heck of a recovery story right now. And they're finally starting to gain some crucial, crucial levels on the technical basis right now. We have just now cleared above a very large sector, a section 67 down to 65. I would be waiting for the breakout retest of this range. We get a little retest here, 67 down to 65. That is going to be an area where I might be tempted to play PayPal for the breakout retest and run as part of this trade. Fundamentals are very, very attractive right now. The valuation is low, but keep in mind, it's the growth, right? PayPal, the reason that PayPal isn't flying right now is that there's still some growth concerns around the company. I really have nothing bad to say about the company other than the fact that it's a bit of a transition year for them as well, even into early 2025. But 2025 and onwards, 
supposedly they will be returning to some of the growth that we were seeing prior to uh, 2020, right? So coming back to EPS growth in 2025 and coming back to de um, defined revenue growth 2025 and onwards. That's why I like this one for a position trade, maybe in the lower 67 down to 65 range for PayPal. Now, moving on further, uh, Miss Unique again asking for, I would like to enter Okta and ESTC for chart reviews. Perfect, no problem at all. So let's do some pure TA on those. And before that, give me a quick second. Can't do a video without a little bit of sip of coffee, right? So uh, Okta, number one for Okta, right? So Okta on the pure, pure, pure technicals right now, Obviously, we have a big earnings drop off right there. I didn't check their earnings or what happened whatsoever, but just the pure form charts. Number one, daily oversold conditions. Obviously, guys, after earnings, we need to wait for this one to bottom out because now we don't really have any clear defined trend whatsoever, right? So we need to wait for a relative local bottom to be formed. We will have a little bit better levels to base our trades off of. That being said, in the event we come down into this support range, this is probably where I'd look for Okta for a little bit more of a swing trade. It's been very nice support for the stock ever since the early portion of 2023. So in the event we pull back down there, guys, there will most likely be some opportunities, especially if we do it in one clean shot. If we come down here, guys, in one single clean sweep of a daily downtrend, we will be in daily oversold conditions and most likely even approaching weekly oversold conditions too. Those are two things that I really look in when I'm looking to take a technical trade on a stock. That being said, guys, they have now lost uh, most of all their long-term trends, right? So they had a semblance of a monthly uptrend going and unfortunately now they lost it, right? So low, lower high, lower low, unfortunately in a monthly downtrend, I'd be looking for a bottoming out of the company here. So first, things first we know monthly is in a downtrend weekly as well is now in a downtrend and the daily as well is now pretty pretty much well not a confirmed daily downtrend you need the lower high into lower low but pretty much right so what i'd be looking for right now since the bulls need to restart everything we're so close if for some much reason we continue moving down to this area I'd be looking for your engulfing move, right? After one of these legs, usually you'll notice these legs get smaller and smaller. Then eventually we get an engulfing move and then we get the bulls making an attempt set up for the daily higher low and then higher high. That's what we're looking for. As soon as I see this daily uptrend pattern, as soon as we get that candle break of the higher highs, this is where I like to enter. We set our stop loss below the most recent daily higher lows because we know that most likely we have now picked the weekly bottoms, right? or we're wrong. That's why we keep a tight stop loss. So this is either gonna be one that runs substantially back maybe into the 90s, or we get stopped out and we have to reevaluate and look for this same pattern a little bit lower. So I would exert a little bit of patience on this one and wait for the confirmation of your daily uptrend because just due to the fact that we're in everything downtrend, right? Monthly downtrend, weekly downtrend, and daily downtrend. So the bears have all the power right now. These, um, these short-term pops can get sold off. So we need to see the bulls establish that daily uptrend pattern for us to have better and more manageable uh, stop loss locations to base those trades off of. But I would be looking, as I said, in this green box down here, for those patterns because that is where the bulls have provided the best bit dip buying opportunities for this company. Now moving into ESTC on a technical basis. So ESTC, let's pull that one out real quick. So ESTC as well, unfortunately one of your uh, earnings uh, one of those stocks that have been hit pretty hard by earnings recently down now the rsi at a rsi oversold level of about a 20. so i love seeing companies in the rsis of 20. it is definitely a potential trade opportunity coming up soon we also do have weekly rsi barely oversold right now not quite now in terms so we do know that a potential opportunity is coming on the stock but similar to okta we have to understand who's in control right now big monthly downtrend on this stock as well on the weekly, big weekly downtrend as well. And unfortunately, bulls have lost now. Well, they were in a daily downtrend before, and that is now just perpetuated. So we need to be a little bit patient with this stock, right? In terms of if we're looking for a longer term swing play, um, and if you think this stock can kind of retest some of its prior levels, especially this 96, all the way down to about 93 zone right there, right? What we need to be patient and waiting out for is Number one, we can look at this support zone and understand that if we start pulling down into there, 
we're going to start to get some support by the bulls. Then when we pull down into here, same concept as Okta, guys. Wait for the daily uptrend confirmation because when we get that breakout, we have a defined stop loss territory and we are going for the weekly bounce, right? So that's what we're going for on both of these companies looking for the weekly bounce. But you only know that the weekly bounce is confirmed to start happening when we get a daily uptrend shift back to the bulls. That means that all your short term momentum to the downside is most likely lost. And now it's the bulls turn to put in a few weekly moves higher, right? So that is the direction that I would take for this trade as well. Looking for a bit of con continuation, but be patient with these ones, right? Be very patient with them. Wait for the pattern to play out. I like those two. I would put them on a watch list and just watch out for those patterns when they start manifesting. The last thing we want to do is try to catch an overall falling knife, especially when the bears have control of the higher time frames, right? Monthly, weekly, and daily. So that is the problem right there. Now, moving into uh, moving into the next ones, PO Box again with another one, ENVX. So let's take a look at that one, brother. No problem at all. So let's take a look at ENVX. So ENVX down about 1.55%, pulling into this big area of support right there. So ENVX, guys, right? Uh, if you guys don't know what ENVX does, I uh, can't blame you as well. I did not know what this one did either before, uh, before he brought it up to me. So thanks very much for these tickers. Really appreciate them. This one I actually, actually like. I would be almost tempted to start a set it and forget it position in this company and try and let the long-term thesis play out. Now, there's a couple things that they're going to have to fight for in terms of carving away the market share, but I like this one. This company, essentially what they do, guys, is they do it. They have an improvement on lithium ion battery technology. They do have a competitive, a proven competitive advantage amongst the industry right now. Obviously, everybody wants better batteries in their laptops, in their smartphones, batteries that do not degrade as fast, batteries that hold their charges as fast. Now, we've made leaps and bounds in uh, in terms of battery technology progress in the last 10, 15 years, right? An iPhone, uh, an iPhone 15 holds its charge and charges faster than, let's say, an iPhone's five or six used to, right? So we do have some improvements, but this company uh, does have a competitive advantage right now, even above the current technology right now. So they're carving out an edge in terms of the fundamentals for the business here, guys. Well, the company is actually bringing in a tiny ever so minuscule amount of revenue per year. Not that much, but what I did want to show you guys is that the projections are actually not that bad. The EPS is going to be curling into 2026 and 2027, and that is where they're going to get most of the revenue bump as well. Another one of these companies that we're in, if we're investing into it for that thesis, we're probably going to need to wait until 26 and 2027, but that is just the cost of taking these plays super early. Sometimes if you want to be super early before everybody and get those 10, 20 X's, you may have to wait for a lot of time because by the time, if you revisit this company in 26 and 27, the share price, especially if they're actually manifesting that growth, the share price is going to be significantly higher and you won't get those X's, right? So the true X's on these trades are made very, very early, but you have to you have to exercise a great deal of patience to wait and see if that thesis does play out. And then there's obviously the risk that that thesis does not play out as a whole, right? So that is going to be the long-term thesis for this company uh, as a whole right now. Company's only valued about 1.68 billion. Of course, they're raising a decent amount of capital uh, from their from their shareholders, right? So they're diluting shareholders a little bit. They don't have that much debt. They do have a decent amount of cash on hand, but they are burning uh, some run right there as well, right? But this one is fairly good. They have one factory. They're building a second one um, from what I read as well. And after second factory is up and fully scaled at production capacity, apparently they will be able to sustain their costs. So that's what we're going to be looking for. Uh, now, is it replicable? So this is something that I have not done research on, but if you have some alpha, if you know a lot about the industry, I would be uh, considering how easily is it to replicate what this company has done by legacy players in the game, such as a company like Panasonic or something like that, right? Or how easy it is uh, for maybe a company like Apple or other companies, right, to uh, tell their own suppliers to start replicating these business, uh, this, this competitive advantage, right? Is it a patent? Do they have proprietary technology that allows them to do that? I don't specifically know, haven't gone that far into it, right? That would require like an hour, two hours, right? We're just trying to do a quick rundown right here. Uh, but yeah, so as of now, definitely a show me company, but I like this one so far. We're at the bottom end of a range, the past two years worth of a range. So in terms of long-term positioning, the time arguably would be right now to build a position if you like these types of bets, right? Got to wait for the 2026 thesis for it, of course. In terms of pure technicals as well, guys, obviously true to be a 
pure technical trade as well into a big area of support we know that we've pretty much lost all of the momentum as of recently this one probably just runs off of news events as well so this is always a good area to be sitting for it right now need to wait for that daily uptrend though right so saw what happened after earnings right here as soon as we recaptured that daily uptrend we are able to stay in the trade never came back towards our lows right here and then gave us that momentum right so these are ones that i tend to like to wait for those confirmations to arise especially when we, when we don't have the weeklies uh, so you might be waiting for that daily uptrend right but in this area right here is where we're looking for that pattern to form where there's large support when we see it we take the breakout we set our stops below the lows if you want to be a bit less um, if you want to be a bit less tight, we can always set it down below here because like I said, if we're looking for the daily uptrend, it means you're looking for the weekly lows, right? So if you find a new daily uptrend and you do believe that is the weekly lows, well, you can be tight with a stop loss there under your daily higher low, or you can actually set it for the weekly bottom to invalidate the weekly upswing as a whole, right? So this would be a little bit conservative. This would be a little bit more lenient, right? So those are the patterns that I'd be looking out for on these. And then we tend to get some good runs, right? When we confirm the daily uptrends, right? We tend to get some good runs thereafter may take some time to play out but usually it does have a good uh, capacity to do so right so a little bit of little bit of patience required on both fronts either for a technical swing trade or the long-term investment so thanks very much for that one uh, moving on to um moving on to uh Ancor right here or ank i'm not too sure how many of these how many of these i'm supposed to line up in a row but let's just say ank right so uh, request to share your perspectives on ONON. Feel like it's better than Nike. Sure, of course. Let's go have a look at ONON. So obviously a uh, up and coming apparel brand. Not so much up and coming because they've been in the marketplace for uh, you know several, several uh, years at this point right now. Now in terms of being better than Nike, that would have to be a, a subjective view, right? It may be in terms of the quality uh, of their products. Perhaps, maybe they do design better shoes. Maybe their shoes are more comfortable depending on the person, right? But that might be a, a more subjective analysis. In terms, of, in terms of a stock as a whole, we're really comparing kind of like apples and oranges, right? Nike is a far more well-established brand as a whole, and they don't only do shoes, right? Obviously, they have this whole apparel brands with them. They obviously have the whole sponsorship business with professional athletes. They have their uh, intangible brand value, which is the Nike brand as a whole, right? So I really wouldn't, other than maybe comparing their shoes against Nike shoes, that's maybe the only comparison we can do with these two companies. Other than that, you know, Nike operates at a much larger scale and a much wider scale as well uh, than ONON. But ONON does have some pretty interesting products to say the least. The company's worth about 15 billion right now. So in terms of the fundamentals, the fundamentals of this business are actually fairly good. So they are a profitable company right now. Net margins, as I've said, for um, for shoe companies, usually always between six to 10% at the higher end of the range. So not expecting crazy net margins from them. They are within the industry standard. In terms of uh, the financials, guys, not, men, not much debt to speak of, far much, uh, far more cash on the balance sheet and decent free cash flow per year for the business. So no red flags on the balance sheet. In terms of expansion for the next couple of years, as we can see, we do have a fairly nice EPS expansion graph over the next couple of years and fairly nice revenue expansion graph as well. And also in terms of social media impact, guys, this brand is very well received by consumers as of recently and does have a decent amount of brand appreciation and brand loyalty across social media platforms. So really operating across well across all fronts, right? Good marketing, good fundamentals, all in all, decent company. Now, in terms of the growth rates right here, the valuation forward PE at 42 bucks is about a 41.6. When we divide that by their EPS growth rate per year, we get a peg of about 1.59. That's actually pretty decent for the company. Now, obviously, it's not the type of discounts we were getting back here in the low 30s, but as of right now, it is actually not too bad. But in terms of a more vast, so this is entirely going to be a growth prospect, right? Because if you're, if you're investing in this one for the pure value alone, not so much, right? Free cash flow yield at 1.48 is really, really, really low. You'd like to see this between 3.5 uh, and 5.3%, which is what Nike is operating on them right now. So Nike doesn't have uh, a low peg right now because its EPS has gotten crushed, right? It does have a PE ratio, which is standard. In terms of the growth rate though, not the best metric for Nike right now, just because it's been declining on EPS. We need to wait for that growth again to happen. So the two metrics uh, for Nike would be the historical PE being within its, within its mean right now and the free cash flow yield. 
as to, even though Nike's not growing much anymore, is it a good value bet down here? Well, the free cash flow yield would point to that being the answer to that question uh, being a yes. A free cash flow yield at 5.1. Anything about five guys starts to be really, really good. It means that the company can pay decent dividends and also buy back shares, which are two artificial ways of pumping share price uh, for shareholders. So uh, ONON cannot do those things because it doesn't have enough free cash flow, but at least it is growing very rapidly on the bottom line. So NON, very nice in terms of uh, a company, in terms of the valuation right now at 15 billion guys, that's a pretty high run rate, right? You're talking at roughly seven and a half times sales. So even though they're growing the bottom line nicely, in terms of the valuation, in terms of market cap running, running away from sales, it's, start, it's starting to get up there a little bit, right? Is there room to grow? Yes, and certain analysts do agree as well. So you can see a few price targets up here, 50, uh, 47, 58. But we're coming into what I like to call terminal fair value where to where anything excess of this starts to get a little bit rich even for a company that is growing well so what i would like to see in terms of a technical aspect for this trade here guys even though we're in a great technical monthly uptrend right now and looks like it is continuing if we want to be technically perfect we may have to wait for a little bit of a pullback right if we can see a pullback into maybe the 42 40 dollar range that could be a better indication to start a position down here because then we have a more uh, defined stop loss area which would be below us right roughly in the 35 to roughly you know high 35s low 35s that could be our stop loss location down there and then we're pretty much targeting the trend expansion possibly up to the all-time highs 50 psychological would be your first stop, right? So that's the type of swing trade that I would like to take on ON. But this one, personally, guys, it's run away a little bit too much for me. I like to pick these ones up usually when they've been consolidating for a number of times. So this one for me right now, it, it's not a buy. It's not a sell. It's just a hold for me right now, right? So hopefully that's uh, educational for ONON. And now the last one, Dustin, would I mind doing ACMR? They've had some interesting price action in the quarter since we last went over the ticker. Yes, no problem at all. I actually remember doing this one uh, back in the day, Dustin. So Back in the day, we were probably highlighting when we did this one right here that they needed to maintain this relevant area of support, right? Now, obviously, since then, we have kind of broken through. So trade invalidated at that certain point, guys. We were looking for the company to set up for the monthly higher low. And unfortunately, they, unfortunately, they just blasted through it. So the trade attempt, I mean, the trade style attempt was a very good one. And then obviously, we unraveled with the, uh, you know, mid-July into August tech sell-off as a whole, right? So maybe not the company's fault specifically. The trade idea, though, was good. I would look to take this trade every single time. It's not to say that they're a 100% win rate, but at least we had high probabilities. Now, in terms of where they stand right now, well, once again, we're going to have to kind of start from scratch, right? So we know that we lost the monthly. So we know we lost the monthly, and we know we also have lost the weekly uptrend as well. They tried for it here and now lost it. So what we're trying to do right now, guys, is a start from scratch, right? Look at the size of the weekly bounce. The weekly size bounce is pretty decent right now. Got all the way up to about 618. So we need the bulls to set up for the weekly higher lows for possible weekly trend recapture right now. Coming down into the 200 weekly moving average, which is this green line right here. And the lower bound of support, you would not like to see them come too low into this one, guys, because it just gives away all of the momentum of this bounce and leads us to believe there may be a revisit of the lows or maybe even cracking the lows as a whole. But right now, there is a swing trade attempt if we're looking to get that weekly uptrend back in motion. And the trade is as follows, right? So we know right now, daily downtrend, looking for the end of the daily downtrend. So we're going to need to wait for slightly engulfing move right there. And if we do get a retest, and then run we can play the breakout right here stop loss go below, goes below the lows and we're looking to play this weekly trend expansion probably back into the resistance area 22 bucks right so that is the way that i would play this one uh, on a more specific fashion in terms of uh, trying to get the best entry and waiting for that daily confirmation right because it is at the end of the day a weekly downtrend the bulls you know even though they want to they're most likely setting up for a rollover. So what we really need to see is that push and then lower, higher low right there, and then the daily trend confirmation. Because if we only get the lower high and then we don't wait for the confirmation and we just enter right here, well, yes, there's a chance that it does this. There's also a chance it just rolls over. That's why I am more firm on waiting for these daily trend confirmations. We can get tight stop loss levels 
and it proves to us the bulls actually want to make a move that can translate into a larger weekly move. So hopefully that's helpful for that one, Dustin. And that pretty much wraps up everything that we had for this video, guys. So once again, I wanted to thank you so much for all the tickers and requesting them so far. Always a pleasure to go through these companies with you guys. And hopefully my brief analysis on each one can help uh, can help a bit with some opinion forming. Of course, obviously none of it was financial advice, just my opinion on the companies and how I would look to view them if I was looking to position in a long-term position for the company or maybe just a short-term momentum trade, right? So once again, guys, always a pleasure. If ever you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them down below in the comment section. And you guys know I always answer you within the first 24 hours. And as usual, guys, if you would, I would appreciate if you like the video for the growth of the channel and consider subscribing to the channel if you're new. We tend to do these videos once every uh, two Saturdays. And then obviously on the channel, we also do the top five options plays every Sunday for the week. And then our Monday through Friday um, daily market recaps where I showcase a lot of the trades that we're looking for and just overall market price action. So thank you so much for watching, guys. Been a pleasure as usual. I will see you tomorrow in the top five options plays for the week. Actually, sorry. Monday, because Monday is a holiday. So we'll do that video on the Monday night. So see you guys soon. Take care and peace.